Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1947's Miracle on 34th Street, directed by George Seaton. Turn it off. Stop it. Turn it off. That won't work. It's no good. But what do you make a trailer for? To give the public an idea of what kind of a picture to expect. But, boss, we think... Hilarious, romantic, tender, exciting. Make up your minds. It can't be all of those things. Mr. Shape, if you'd look at the picture... I don't have to look at the picture. I know you're wrong. Tender, exciting. Why, they're practically opposites. You've got to decide what kind of a picture this is. Is it a romantic love story? Is it an exciting thriller? Is it a hilarious comedy? Make up your minds. Now go to work and fix it up. Hey, Rex. How are you? Ed, how are you? Good to see you. How's the ghost of Mrs. Muir? It's pretty good, I think. How's New York? Fine. Say, Rex, have you seen Miracle on 34th Street? Yes, saw the preview. I've never heard laughs like it in the theater before. Oh, is that right? Uh, don't miss it. I was crazy about it. You really think we've got something, huh? I don't know whether the women will like it, but it's a great man's picture. Well, it's nice to see you, Ed. Got to get back to work. Yeah. See you later. Oh, I'm so... Oh. Ann yes. Baxter, Hello, good to see Ed. you. How are you? I haven't seen you since the Academy Awards. Congratulations on winning that Oscar. Thanks, Ed, very much. Oh, uh, say, Anne. Yeah. Have you seen Miracle on 34th Street? Have I? Ed, it's wonderful. Yeah, I understand. It's a pretty good comedy. Comedy? Well, I suppose that's true. I had a million laughs, but the thing that got me were, were the tears in between. It's so tender and charming and warm. I don't know how the men are going to like it. It's a great woman's picture. Is that so? Oh, there's one scene between John Payne and Maureen O'Hara. Well, he's trying to prove... No. I'm not going to spoil it for you. You go and see it. I'm sorry, Mr. Schaefer. I'm just learning to drive. So I see. How are you, Peggy Ann? <laughs> I'm fine now that I know I didn't hit you. Tell me, have you seen Miracle on 34th Street? Three times, and it's simply groovy. Mr. Gwen's just wonderful. You know, we worked together in Bob's Son of Battle. Yeah, I saw it. He's great in it. Wait till you see him in this. You'll love him, and you'll love the picture, too. I tell you, it's a groovy movie. Don't you think so, Dick? Dick! Yeah. Dick Hames, I didn't see you. Well, I've been on the floor. That sudden stop got me. <laughs> oh, but seriously, Peggy's right. That Miracle on 34th Street is really something. You know, with me, moving pictures have got to move. They've got to be exciting and different. And this thing is really it. It's the most unusual story that I've ever seen. In the last 20 minutes of the picture, I had me sitting on the edge of my seat every second of the time. And what a finish. Yeah. Maybe I ought to take a look at it. Well, if you run it again, tell me about it. Okay, we're ready. is the greatest picture I have ever made. And I've got the angle on the trailer. Boys, we've got to get across to the public that that picture has everything. Why, it's hilarious. It's romantic. It's tender. It's charming. It's delightful. It's exciting. And it's groovy. 
Yes, yes, Mr. Schaefer. That does it, boss. Mr. Schaefer, you've got a great idea. Naturally. Now, I'll tell you what we do. Christmas time is here again. I've told you all before how I enjoy this time of year and it's good to feel the spirit again. Last year was a total wash. I think it was, it was the middle of the worst year I think I've ever had in my life, but things are looking up again and I can feel the spirit again. This movie has a lot to do with that feeling coming back. You'll have noticed that in the trailer they never really mentioned what this film is about. The reason for that is as follows. Studio head Daryl F. Zanuck insisted the film be released in the summer because, quote, more people go to movies in the summertime, unquote. Because of this bizarre insistence on releasing the film in May, they made the unique trailer you just saw. If you haven't seen the movie yet, and I hope you haven't, because I'd love to have you remember seeing it on this show for the first time. It is absolutely delightful, and that's not a word I use often or carelessly. This is one of those movies that just warms your heart you know i mean it takes it takes an idea that is on the surface at least silly and tells it in such a way that you just get swept up in the story and you don't mind one little bit the plot is as follows a kindly bewhiskered old man is hired to play santa claus by doris walker who's in charge of the macy's thanksgiving day parade the old man who goes by the name of chris kringle then takes his place as the store santa and proves to be amazingly adapted playing the part we find out that Mrs. Walker has a seven-year-old daughter named Susan. Susan is watching the parade in the apartment of a young lawyer, Fred Gailey, who lives across the courtyard from Doris's apartment. Now, I have a brief aside here. When I was telling my great and good friend Scott about this film, he's never seen it, so I'm going to be sure he does now. When I mentioned that Doris and her daughter lived in an apartment, he informed me that at the time this movie was shot, a woman, never mind a divorced one, could not get a house loan at all. They had to be married or have a male co-signer. That has nothing to do with the movie, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Anyway, when Fred takes Susan to see Chris at Macy's, Doris, who is bitter about her divorce, takes him aside and explains that she is raising her daughter not to believe in fairy tales or Santa or any of that fantasy stuff because life is not a fairy tale. She says, by filling them full of fairy tales, they grow up considering life a fantasy instead of a reality. They keep waiting for Prince Charming to come along, and when he does, he turns out to be a... And Fred replies, not unkindly, we were talking about Susie, not about you. She's not militant about it, but she she's firm. You know, Doris believes in encouraging her daughter to believe in such things is detrimental to her psyche, but doesn't realize that in reality, she's robbing her daughter of the magic of her childhood. While this conversation is going on, Susan walks back to check out Chris a little more and sees him meet a little orphan Dutch girl who was adopted by an American couple. The adoptive mother apologizes, saying the little girl doesn't speak English, but when she saw Chris in the parade, she insisted he was Sinterklaas and wanted to see him. To everyone's amazement and the little girl's delight, Chris speaks to her in her native language and they sing a Christmas song together. One of the amazing things about this movie is how closely it hews to reality and how the characters deal with this old man's claim to be Santa, in addition to the things he does in the spirit of Christmas. Things like sending customers to other stores to get the items they're looking for instead of insisting they shop at Macy's and only Macy's. This is something you absolutely did not do, especially referring customers to Gimbel's department store, Macy's largest competitor. The manager of the toy department overhears Chris doing this, and while dithering over how to handle it, he's accosted by a customer that's just taken their child to see Chris and compliments him on the store's new policy and promises that, although she's never shopped at Macy's very much, they now have a steady customer. More customers go out of their way to praise the new policy, but not until the manager and Mrs. Walker are summoned to the office of R.H. Macy himself do they learn that Macy loves this new policy. He praises the idea, saying that it shows Macy's is a store with a heart, more concerned with the satisfaction of its customers than profits. 
He also points out that profits will rise as a result of this, so naturally he congratulates the two on their initiative, telling them that, telling them that they'll get a substantial Christmas bonus that year. This film was made with a lot of care, both in the story and in the casting. The fact that just about everyone in this film support, that supports Chris at first have selfish reasons for doing so, and then the fact that they come to embrace the spirit Chris espouses is one of the great things about it. The casting is perfection. Edmund Gwen is absolutely perfect as Chris. John Payne is properly heroic and human as Fred Gailey. Natalie Wood is adorable as Susan. She was eight years old at the time this was made. And the film is filled to overflowing with the best character actors that were in Hollywood at the time. The one fault I can find in this film is the performance of Maureen O'Hara. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Maureen O'Hara. She's absolutely old school gorgeous, and you can, but you can see that she's acting. I have this belief that I apply to acting, and that is this. The best acting is no acting. By this I mean that when I see someone trying to act, someone just doing their best but being so overly earnest and expressive in what they say that they completely overdo it, it just drives me to distraction. Especially in comparison with everyone else in the movie, Maureen O'Hara's performance sticks out like a sore thumb. That opinion is a quibble, though. This is one of my favorite Christmas movies ever. It doesn't have the darkness of It's a Wonderful Life, and that movie was dark. This one fits my definition of a Christmas story perfectly. The film had its genesis in a story that writer Valentine Davies came up with while doing his Christmas shopping. He was looking for a gift for his wife and was dismayed at the amount of commercialism he saw on display. He got to wondering what Santa Claus would make of this, and there it was. When director George Seaton read the story, he desperately wanted to make it into a film, but studio head Daryl F. Zanuck refused, feeling that it was too corny. He finally relented when Seaton consented to making his next three movies with this, for the studio with no special conditions. This film was remade three times as a TV movie and progressively screwed up more each time, as always happens when a classic is remade and updated to make it more timely. As if to prove that a film doesn't need to be remade to screw it completely up, Miracle on 34th Street was the first film to be subjected to that horrible process known as colorization in an attempt to interest young people who felt that black and white movies were too old fashioned. While I have met a disturbing number of young people who do indeed feel that way, I don't believe colorization was ever a good idea. All it ever, all it ever did was screw up something that was fine in the first place, in addition to just looking terrible. Edmund Gwen was born Edmund John Kellaway on September 26, 1877 in Wandsworth, London, England. As the oldest son in his family, his father attempted to groom him to become a civil servant just like him, but Edmund had other aspirations. He originally considered joining the Royal Navy, but his poor eyesight and his mother's concerns about losing him at sea interfered with his plans. After attending St. Olaf's and King's College in London, he decided on a career in acting. His father didn't react well to this and kicked him out of the house. Despite his lack of experience and really having no choice, he traveled to London and began appearing in small roles on stage. He insisted on wearing a beard or other makeup to disguise himself for fear that Someone that knew him would see him and report back to his father. For the next 10 years, he toured with stock companies that appeared in everything from Shakespeare to old melodramas. This experience served him well. After a short-lived marriage, he went to Australia and did his acting thing for three years. While there, he appeared in a small role in the, in the play In the Hospital and was noticed by George Bernard Shaw, who sent him a postcard offering him a leading role as Straker in his play, Man and Superman. The play was a hit, and Shaw became a mentor to Gwen, who spent three years in Shaw's repertory company, remembering it as the happiest days I've ever had in the theater. He served in the Royal Army in World War I and worked his way up to the rank of captain before being discharged. He returned to the stage and began performing in films, the first being 1916 short, The Real Thing at Last. He appeared in four Alfred Hitchcock films, among them 1931's The Skin Game and 1940's Foreign Correspondent, in addition to dozens of others, including a personal favorite of mine and past Cleveland Classic Cinema movie, 1941's The Devil and Miss Jones as Mr. Hooper, the floor manager. 
That role was about as far as could be from his role in tonight's movie, but he was still excellent in it. He played bad guys and kind old men and everything in between, and he was a well-known character actor, but not a star. When 20th Century Fox was in the planning stages of making tonight's movie, they first offered the role of Chris Kringle to Gwen's cousin, Cecil Kellaway, but Kellaway turned it down, feeling that Americans don't care for whimsy. They then offered the role to Gwen, who jumped on it, and at the age of 71, he finally became a star. He won a Best Supporting Actor Academy Award for the role and, on accepting it, said, Now I know there is a Santa Claus. Gwen had put 30 pounds on his small frame in order to play Chris and was never able to lose it. It didn't make any difference to casting directors, however. He went on to star in 40 more movies and television shows, including 1950's Mr. 880 as a kindly counterfeiter, and 1954's Them, the first, and in my humble opinion, best, of the giant bug movies of the 50s. Although crippled with arthritis, he continued to act until retiring to the motion picture home in Woodland Hills, California. He suffered a stroke and contracted pneumonia, dying on September 6, 1959. He was 81 years old. Maureen O'Hara was born Maureen Fitzsimmons on August 17, 1920, in Rainlaw, County Dublin, Ireland. A natural athlete, she played rough sports as a young girl and was a bit of a tomboy, also displaying a natural ability for acting and having a beautiful soprano voice. By the age of 14, she was accepted into the Abbey Theatre and there was discovered by Charles Lawton, who immediately cast her in 1939's Jamaica Inn. She was all of 19 years old. Feeling that she needed a shorter name for marquee value, they shortened her last name from Fitzsimmons to O'Hara. Her second film was 1939's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and from there she went on to appear in 1941's How Green Was My Valley, 1948's Sitting Pretty, 1952's The Quiet Man, 1961's The Parent Trap, and 1963's McClintock with John Wayne, among many, many others. In 1968, she married General Charles Blair, an Air Force aviator. After retiring from motion pictures in 1973, she and her husband founded Antilles Airboats, a commuter seaplane air service in the Caribbean. When General Blair died in a plane crash in 1978, she pulled herself together and became the chairwoman and CEO of Antilles Airboats. She occasionally comes out of, out of retirement to make a movie, her last being 1991's Only the Lonely with John Candy and 1995's The Christmas Box for CBS. She appeared in two more TV movies for CBS before retiring for good in 2000. Maureen, Maureen O'Hara is what a friend of mine refers to as a woman. Absolutely gorgeous, tough as nails, strong, and still an absolute woman. A tough broad, to put it in a less delicate way. Interestingly, she was eating lunch with Lucille Ball when Lucy first laid eyes on Desi Arnaz. She was a very close friend and admirer of John Wayne, having appeared in five movies with him, and once said, Speaking as an actress, I wish all actors would be more like Duke. And speaking as a person, it would be nice if all people could be as honest and as genuine as he is. This is a real man. John Wayne, in turn, called Maureen O'Hara his favorite actress and the only woman he considered a true friend. When he was on his deathbed, he watched on TV as Miss O'Hara petitioned Congress to award him a Congressional Gold Medal, which they did by unanimous vote. Maureen O'Hara is still alive and well today, and if I may say so, she hasn't lost any of her looks. She's still a magnificent-looking woman and just as tough as she ever was. John Howard Payne was born on May 23, 1912 in Roanoke, Virginia. His parents, George Washington Payne and former Metropolitan Opera singer Ida Hope Payne, were well-to-do when John grew up in a privileged home, the second of three boys. At his mother's request, John took singing lessons to help him overcome his shyness. While studying at Roanoke College, his father died and John left academia to help support his family, working as a male nurse and also as a singer on local radio. He later returned to his studies, enrolling at the Pulitzer School of Journalism and also picking up extra cash as a sometime boxer and wrestler. He ventured into acting and while appearing as an understudy in the musical At Home Abroad, was spotted by Samuel Goldwyn himself and signed to a contract with MGM, appearing in a minor role in 1936, Dodsworth. But nothing much came of it, and he was released. 
He freelanced for a number of years, appearing in both movies and stage productions, hopping from Paramount to Warner Brothers and finally landing at 20th, 20th Century Fox, where he started a number of musicals before landing the lead role in 1941's Remember the Day with Claudette Colbert. After that role, things finally began to happen for Payne. He appeared in a number of movies with Betty Grable and then did a two-year stint in the Army. When he was discharged, he returned to Hollywood and continued with 20th Century, where he met and eventually married Gloria de Haven. His first on-screen appearance with Maureen O'Hara was 1946's Sentimental Journey, and he then starred in the same year as The Razor's Edge, followed by tonight's film. After leaving Fox, Payne went on to star in independently produced movies, but being a shrewd businessman, made deals with the producers that greatly benefited him. He invested extensively in Southern California real estate, and we all know how that paid off. In 1961, Payne was struck by a car and spent six years recovering from his injuries. Once he was well, he returned to the stage and began appearing on TV, starring in his own Western series, The Restless Gun, for two years. He went on appearing on television until retiring in 1975. When asked what his favorite movie was, he always replied, Miracle on 34th Street. John Payne died from congestive heart failure in his Malibu home on December 6, 1989. Natalie Wood was born Natalia Nikolaevna Saharenko on July 20, 1938 in San Francisco, California. While growing up in Santa Rosa, her production company came, came to shoot in, in the town, and Natalie, then four years old, was hired to play a little girl crying over a dropped ice cream cone in 1943's Happy Land. Her family moved to Hollywood in the hopes of young Natalie getting more film work, but things didn't work out that way, at least at first. She eventually got work in movies, not making much of a splash until she appeared in tonight's film. She is an adorable little girl, showing both adult-like cynicism and childlike wonder in equal measure in her role. After the film was released, she became a very busy young lady indeed, appearing in 18 films between the late 40s and the mid-50s. At the age of 16, she appeared as Judy in 1955's Rebel Without a Cause. She received her first Academy Award nomination and went on to appear in 1961's Splendor in the Grass and West Side Story, both huge hits, and then starred in 1962's Gypsy and 1963's Love with the Proper Stranger. After appearing in 1966 as this property is condemned, she left Hollywood for three years to get some rest and decide where she wanted to go from there. Her comeback film was 1969's Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. She didn't work much after that, choosing her roles with care and doing films she felt were interesting. She made several TV appearances and in 1981 co-starred with her good friend Christopher Walken in Brainstorm, her last film. On November 29, 1981, she was on a yacht with Walken and her husband, Robert Wagner. No one really knows what happened, but apparently following an argument, she tried to board a dinghy tied up alongside the yacht and fell into the water where she drowned. She was 43 years old. I could go on for another 20 minutes doing bios of all the wonderful character actors in this film. Porter Hall, William Frawley, Jerome Cowan, Philip Tong, Thelma Ritter in her first movie appearance is the, at first, irate Christmas shopper who confronts Chris about promising her little boy a fire truck she can't find anywhere. And Jack Albertson in his third role as the postal worker who ends up saving the day. But we have to get to the movie, so it's time to sum up. Miracle on 34th Street is one of my favorite Christmas movies ever again. It doesn't get dragged down with religious overtones or dark nights of the soul. And having had a couple of Dark Nights of the Soul myself in the last year or so, I really appreciate that. Instead, it deals with a lovely, kind gentleman who claims to be Santa Claus and deals with it in a realistic manner. Well, realistic for 1947 Hollywood anyway. There are plenty of Christmas movies that deal with the meaning of the holiday, so I feel that showing one that deals with the spirit of the holiday is just fine. This is certainly a fantasy, but what better time of year to share it? I remember that when I was a kid, we'd come downstairs from our bedrooms into the living room and see all the presents laid out under the tree, and we'd be busting to open them, but we had to get our parents up first so my dad could take pictures of us. Of course, since my parents had been up until God knows when wrapping said gifts, they were a bit slow getting out of bed and downstairs, so we'd be just about rabid by the time they came down. 
I think I mentioned this before, but right around the 23rd of the month, I start getting like downright psychotic about my Chris, about Christmas, and my mom usually had to slip me like half a pill of Valium or something on Christmas Eve, just to knock my dumb little butt out, so she could she and my father could wrap presents in peace. Those Christmas mornings, and what I can remember of them, at least, were wonderful. My dad used to say that Christmas was for kids, but I remember the look in his eye when we opened the gifts he gave us. He enjoyed it as much as we did. I have to admit that last year was not the best holiday season I have ever had. It was about a third of the way, again, through the worst year I've ever had in my life. But I am very glad to say that things are finally on the upswing and I feel the Christmas spirit again. I want everyone else to feel it too, so please, take this gift we're offering in the spirit of the season when you sit back, relax, and enjoy a Miracle on 34th Street right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. Merry Christmas, everybody.